But let's get started with uh, Parashal Beishalak this week. So hopefully you were listening to the reading um, as we were going along there. This, as I said, this is quite an important Torah portion. Um, it teaches us a very important lesson, which I think some of us will probably claim that we've got this down already. We're pretty good at this already, but there, I know that there are a lot of people that are not very good at this. And it may be some of you out there watching this video, maybe you're watching it later. Um, maybe it's something that you're not very good at. Maybe it's something that you feel a bit ashamed of. But uh, I wanted to bring this, this lesson to you this week because, as I said, this is a lesson that my parents taught me and my brother when we were quite little uh, as we were growing up and the importance of this. And it's something that I want to make sure that my children also understand, which is why I wanted to make sure we had them with us today. Um, we're going to start in Parashal Beishalak, Shemot, Exodus 15, verse 20 and 21 is where we're going to start. This is what it says. It says, Also Miriam the prophet, sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines, dancing. As Miriam sang to them, Sing to Hashem, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider threw in the sea. This portion of scripture showcases another one of the foundational principles of our faith, our life, and our culture, which is why I wanted to bring it to you again this week. And it sort of is building on what we built on last week. Maybe it's something you don't do often. Maybe it's something you do every once in a while, or maybe you don't do this at all. Whatever the case, it's something we often don't spend much time meditating on when it comes to its significance and profound importance. And it's something we often take for granted. So I'm sure by now you're saying, Josh, you've held us for this long. What is it? What are you going to talk about? It's the powerful God-given ability to sing songs and make music. Whether you feel funny or awkward when it comes to these things, there's something that we should all take hold of. And they're an important part of each of our lives and an important part of Adonai's kingdom. Hashem created the phenomenon of music, not only for His glory, but also as a means of spiritual power and as a spiritual tool, and even as a spiritual weapon to enable us and equip us to be victors in our war against dark spiritual forces, and even against our own wicked Yetzir Hara, and you'll remember that's our evil inclination. Music is also an effective and complex method of communication that can communicate things in ways that simple speech or written text just can't do. Music is a unique language that communicates a massive amount of information, and it stimulates a multitude of our senses in ways that we often don't comprehend. This is one of the reasons why the Jewish people have always sung their prayers and the scriptures. I wanted to share a little picture with you today. Hopefully you'll be able to, oh, that's not the right one. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. Hopefully you can see the little blue marks over the Hebrew words there, the Hebrew letters. The little blue marks, and on the right, on the end, there's one just at the bottom. It's a sort of an L shape kind of there at the bottom. Those are called cantillation marks. Cantillation marks. And this is uh, this is Genesis 1:9, and God said, Let the waters be collected. That's what this says here. And it has those cantillation marks over and underneath those words. The cantillation marks found on the Hebrew Mesoartic texts are called ta'amim, which comes from the Hebrew word ta'am, which interestingly enough means, do you know what it means? You know what ta'am means? It means taste in Hebrew, taste. Now hold on to that. The cantillation marks, instructing us how the words of the Torah should be chanted or sung, are referred to in this way because the singing of God's word brings another sense of understanding and meaning. And it's said that it gives us an additional taste or sense for what's being communicated that couldn't be acquired by simply reading the Hebrew text. In addition, our people have found that through the vehicle of music, information can be retained and memorized in ways that weren't possible before. One of the tricks to memorizing something, and I use this a lot, is by singing it. This is because it engages so many of our senses and so many parts of our brains that other forms of communication just don't affect. The vehicle of music 
is a mysterious conduit of communication and a vehicle to deliver many unseen things. But brothers and sisters, what we need to understand, and this is what I want my children to understand today, is that these things can be used for either good or bad. So it's important that, we careful, that we're careful about what kind of music we listen to. And instead of listening to worldly music, we should try to make our own music and our own tunes for Adonai. Look, the fact is, brothers and sisters, music profoundly affects all of us. All of us. And even if you say I'm not affected, I'm not that much into music. Watch a movie, watch a film and, and tell me you don't get moved by the music in that movie or that film. It's done that way for a reason. Because they know music affects you and it moves you in different ways. And so they can manipulate your emotion based on the type of music that they put in a particular scene. So music profoundly affects all of us. Listen, it, it even affects people that you think wouldn't be affected. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about people that may have suffered some kind of brain injuries or brain damage. Do you know that medical science is discovering the significant power and the importance that music has in our world? And on this subject, a PBS News article, it discusses these findings. And PBS, it's a, it's a station in the U.S. It's a bit like the BBC. It's a television station. But they did a news article about music and the effects on people, particularly that had brain injuries. Listen to what this article said. It says, music is a complex stimulus involving everything from pitch to rhythm, melody to volume. Consequently, listen to what this says. Consequently, it's not processed in a single area of the brain. We can see this in what's called amusia, in which a single musical skill is lost when a specific area of the brain is damaged. For example, some of you might think you have this problem. For example, loss of pitch perception resulting from lesions to the right temporal lobe. But while a component of music such as pitch may be processed in a specific region of the brain, the overall experience of music is a gestalt of perceptual and uh, phys physiological processes occurring in synchrony and involving a spectrum of neurological activity and brain regions. This goes on to say, we now know from clinical case studies that music can affect in very specific ways human neurological, physiological, and physical functioning in areas such as learning, processing language, expressing emotion, memory, and physiological and motor responses. Brothers and sisters, that to me is fascinating that they can find these things out by simply playing music to people who have brain injuries. They have seen improvements in that person's overall being. So it leads me to the question that I wanted to really bring before you today, which is if these facts are true about the music that these scientists are using in their studies, how much more wonderful must the effects of this be through the musical mode of praise and worship to Adonai? How much better must that be? And I think that's something the scientists of the world should study. They need to study that effect. What does singing praise to our Creator actually do to us? Of course, brothers and sisters, everything that I've said it all just confirms what our Jewish brothers and sisters have known for thousands of years. So it's no wonder that a large portion of Jewish prayer services, if you've ever been a part of those, you know they sound like a musical. They sing prayers, they sing praises to Adonai, and they sing and they chant the Word of God. It's an important part of the Eitz Chaim, the Tree of Life, that Adonai has given to all of us brothers and sisters. As we continue to meditate on this, what I want to do is let's search Scripture for further significance regarding the subject of songs and music in our lives and in Adonai's kingdom. As I mentioned, I believe this has application for all God's people, not just those of us who may have a talent or a gift for singing or for music. 
Look, even if you sing off key all the time, or maybe like me, you cause the neighborhood dogs to howl when they hear you singing. The fact is singing praises to Adonai has a special place in each one of our lives, or at least it should. Let's put it that way. It should have an important part to each one of our lives. Even if singing or making music isn't your forte, you should sing as best you can. You should do the best that you can. To Hillam 33, verses 3 through 4, it says, Sing to him a new song. Make music at your best among shouts of joy. For the word of Hashem is true, and all his work is trustworthy. Your singing to Adonai doesn't have to be perfect or necessarily even pleasant to listen to. But as we just read in Tehillim 33, we just need to give it our best. Give it your best try. And when we do this, brothers and sisters, do you know what happens? When you give it your best try, whether you're on key, off key, whether you make up your own key, you have fulfilled the mitzvah and you'll reap the benefit of that mitzvah. As we can see in our previous passage, and as we'll continue to see, it's a mitzvah, it's a command to sing to Adonai, or something called shiru la Adonai, singing to Adonai. And every mitzvah that he gives us is not only for his glory, but it's ultimately, brothers and sisters, it's for our own good. Not only does the Torah say in Shemot 1521, sing to Hashem, for he is highly exalted. Not only did we read in Tehillim 33.3, sing to Hashem a new song, make music at your best among shouts of joy. But brothers and sisters, the fact is scripture mentions this mitzvah over and over and over. As we'll see, it's a spiritual tool and it's even a spiritual weapon. Your song is a spiritual weapon. And we can all use it in, a, in our struggles against the dark and the wicked principalities of this world. And just as it, is, as it is with our regular prayer and study, brothers and sisters, the community of Messiah need to learn and discipline ourselves to engage in the musical praise and worship of Adonai much more often. This is an amazing and powerful component of our faith that we need to incorporate into every day of every week. Not just one day a week on Shabbat. To Hillam 98 verses 1 through 3, it says, Sing a new song to Hashem because He has done wonders. His right hand, His holy arm have won Him victory. Hashem has made known his victory, revealed his vindication in, his, in full view of the nations, remembered his grace and faithfulness to the house of Yisrael. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. One of the reasons given for the mitzvah to sing praises to Adonai in our last passage, as it was in our passage in Parashat Be Shalak, is not only because of his wondrous not because of just the things that he's done, but also because his right hand, his holy arm, which is the Messiah. Brothers and sisters, he has won the victory. This alone is reason enough for us to sing to him every single day of our life. To Hillam 150, verses 1 through 6, it says, Hallelujah! Praise God in His holy place. Praise Him in the heavenly dome of His power. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with a blast on the shofar. Praise Him with the lute and the lyre. Praise Him with tambourines and dancing. Praise Him with flutes and strings. Praise Him with clanging cymbals. Praise Him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath Praise Hashem. Hallelujah. This passage, brothers and sisters, as I've just read it to you, and you can't claim ignorance anymore, this passage leaves us all with no excuse. As it says, let everything that has breath praise Hashem. So it's all encompassing. Everything that breathes is commanded to sing praises to Adonai. And as I try to encourage my children to sing to Adonai, 
I try to teach them that although they should do their best, and I think you should, you don't always have to get the words right all the time because mom and dad rarely do. We're all just conduits that carry the song of our hearts to Adonai. You see, Adonai, because of his greatness, he can see the true music and the true tune that's coming from our hearts, which, depending on the state of your heart, can be one of the purest and the most pleasant sounds ever made. A magnificent sound that only Adonai can truly perceive. Even if you just open your mouth and you sing from your heart, do you know what you are? You're like the birds in the morning who sing their cheerful songs to their Creator. You see, the birds may not really understand what they're singing, but regardless, they sing to their Creator. And if Adonai listens and he enjoys the songs that he's given to creation, like birds and even whales, you've heard whale songs before? If he enjoys those things, how much more, brothers and sisters, is he going to enjoy the sincere, heartfelt, and joyful sounds of mankind as we lift up our voices to him? How much more special will that be to him? In Ephesians 5, 16 to 19, Raph Shoal insists that we use our time well. And I think this is an area of our life, brothers and sisters, that we all need more practice in. Are we using our time well? And in this passage, he gives us a specific example of one thing we should fill our days with. Instead of wasting our time with the fleshly things of this world, and that's what it is, Make no mistake, all these fleshly things around us, brothers and sisters, they're a waste of time. And instead of wasting our times with these things, listen to what Rav Shaul says. What should we do? He says, use your time well, for these are evil days. And brothers and sisters, these days that we're in are evil days. Listen to what he goes on to say. So don't be foolish, but try to understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine because it makes you lose control. Instead, keep on being filled with the Spirit. Listen, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to each other. Sing to the Lord and make music in your heart to Him. That's what Rav Shaul says is something that is important. That's what he says is worthwhile. That's what he says is worth doing. Again, note how he says that we should spend our days. He says this in the plural. He doesn't say you should spend your Shabbat or you should spend 15 minutes on your Shabbat. He says we should spend our days this way. These are things that we're commanded to do, not just one day a week for a, fall, a small fraction of that day. This is something that's supposed to be happening every single day. Again, just as it's supposed to be with our regular times of prayer each day and our study of His Word throughout the week. Brothers and sisters, we're called to make music in our hearts to Him every day. This should be a part of a Torah-pursuant lifestyle. But the problem is, do we have time for it? Do you make time for it? Do you see this as a valuable part of your life? Do you even know that it is a valuable part of your life? You see, the reality is, brothers and sisters, if you truly understood its value, the real question wouldn't be, do I have time to sing praises? The real question would be, do I really have time to pursue the carnal lust of my flesh that I pursue on a daily basis to the detriment of my personal time spent with, in praise and worship of Adonai? That's the real question. In chapter 5, verse 13 of his book, the emissary Yaakov, he says, is someone among you in trouble? He should pray. Is someone feeling good? He should sing songs of praise. We should remember that in Jewish culture, Yaakov's culture, although prayers were done silently or they were simply said, more often than not, brothers and sisters, they were sung. So whether someone's in trouble, whether they're feeling good, singing to Adonai would be very appropriate. 
And as we've seen, it's not only a suggestion. He doesn't just suggest that we should do these things. It's a mitzvah. So it's an obligation for Yisrael and all believers in the Messiah to do. And just as it is with most of the mitzvahs that we do, it's often only after we faithfully walked out that mitzvah that we see and we finally understand the wisdom and the benefit behind it. Again, Rabbi Yaakov, he says, is someone among you in trouble? He should pray. Now, some of you might be saying, well, he says prayer there. He's not talking about singing. So how, Josh, do you surmise that this can also include singing worship to Adonai? Singing to Adonai isn't only a type of prayer. Not only was it part of the Jewish culture to incorporate a type of tune in our prayers, but did you know that the Greek in this passage can also communicate this? The Greek word here translated as pray is prosukamai. And depending on the context, the word is defined as to pray, supplicate, or worship. Of course, prayer, praise and worship is a type of prayer. I, I wouldn't argue against that. And the immediate context of the passage that we've just read, it does mention singing praises. So it links the two in this verse. And the Tanakh itself, it also teaches us that this is something that we should do if we're in trouble. Sing praises. If you're in trouble, sing praises. Have you ever thought to do that? If you're anything like me, most of the time, if you get in trouble, the first thing you do is you start to worry. The last thing you want to do is actually sing. But brothers and sisters, the Tanakh tells us it's the first thing that we should do. Are you in trouble? Sing praises. We see an example of this in 2 Chronicles 20, verses 12 through 30. As the children of Israel found themselves in trouble, and as foreign armies were bearing down on them, listen to what it says. We read this, Our God, won't you execute judgment against them? For we haven't strength enough to defeat this huge horde coming against us, and we don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. All Yehuda stood before Hashem with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Then in the middle of the assembly, the spirit of Hashem came upon Yaxel, the son of Zekiahu, the son of Benieh, the son of Yael, the son of Mataniah, the Levi, from the descendants of Asaph. Listen to what he says. He said, listen, all Yehuda, you who live in Yerushalayim, and King Jehoshaphat, here is what Hashem is saying to you. Listen closely. Don't be afraid or distressed by this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will be coming up by the ascent of Zitz, and you will find them at the end of the Vadi before the Urel Desert. Listen to what he says. You won't even need to fight this battle. Just take your positions, Yehuda and Yerushalayim. Stand still and watch how Hashem will deliver you. Don't be afraid or distressed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for Hashem is with you. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, while all Yehuda and the inhabitants of, and inhabitants of Yerushalayim fell down before Hashem, worshiping Hashem. Again, I'll remind you, worship happens on your face. Praise happens on your feet. And the Leviim from the descendants of the Kenahites and the descendants of the Korhites stood up and praised Hashem, the God of Israel, at the top of their voices. They stood up and they praised Hashem, the God of Israel, at the top of their voices. They didn't sit quietly in a corner while these things were going on. They didn't sit back and say, oh, what if somebody sees me? They might hear that I'm off key or off tune. It says they praise God to the top of their voices. What happened? The next morning, they rose early and went out into the Tekoa Desert. As they left, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Yehuda, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Trust in Hashem your God, and you will be safe. Trust in His prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting with the people, he appointed, listen, after consulting with the people, he didn't look for warriors. He didn't look for men with spears and swords. 
He appointed those who would sing to Hashem and praise the splendor of His holiness. As they went out ahead of the army, saying, Give thanks to Hashem, for His grace continues forever. Then, during the time when they were singing and praising, during the time they were singing and praising, brothers and sisters, Hashem brought a, su a surprise attack against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who came to fight Yehuda, and they were defeated through singing and praising. Israel didn't have to lift one sword. Through singing, through praising, they were defeated. And then it goes on to describe what had happened. What happened was that the people of Ammon and Moab began attacking those people who lived by Mount Seir to kill and destroy them completely. And when they'd completely done that and they'd finished off the people of Seir, they set to work slaughtering one another. So when Yehuda reached the watchtower overlooking the desert, they looked down toward the horde and you know what they saw? And there in front of them were corpses fallen to the ground. None had escaped, not one. Jehoshaphat and his army came to take the spoil from them and found among them personal property in abundance and corpses with precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves until they couldn't carry any more. Listen, listen to how long it took them. They took three days just to collect the spoil. There was so much. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Bracha, blessing, where they blessed Hashem. Hence, that place is called the Valley of Bracha to this day. Then they returned, everyone from Yehuda and Yerushalayim, with Jehoshaphat, leading them joyfully back to Yerushalayim. For Hashem had caused them to rejoice over their enemies. They came to Yerushalayim with lyres, lutes, trumpets, and went out to the house of Hashem. A panic from God was on all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard that Hashem had fought against the enemies of Yisrael. So Jehoshaphat's rule was a quiet one because God gave him rest all around. And brothers and sisters, do you know how it happened? It wasn't through sword, it wasn't through spear, and it wasn't through shield. It was through lifting their voices to Hashem. Lifting their voices to Hashem. What can we learn from this, tour, this portion of the Tanakh? What can we learn from this lesson, brothers and sisters? It's simply that some of our biggest battles can be won, and some of our biggest foes, if you're struggling against a particular person, some of our biggest foes can be vanquished by taking our eyes off the enemy, which seems counterintuitive. But brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today, take your eyes off the enemy and turn them towards Adonai while you praise him with all of your heart, with all of your soul and all of your strength. If you haven't been utilizing this amazing spiritual weapon that we've been given, and you haven't been taking advantage of this awesome power, and you've been trying to fight your battles and fight your foes on your own through your own fleshly methods. You've been going around, around about it the wrong way. You're doing everything the wrong way around. Look, as I've gone through battles in my life, and I've gone through my fair share, I've learned this more and more. And I can say that one of the reasons I've been able to endure the battles that I've faced in my life, and they were pretty strong, and there was a lot of pressure. The battles that I've been able to endure, it's because Adonai has been training me to keep my eyes on him. And he's taught me to lift up my voice in praise and worship to him with joy from my heart in the midst of those battles. But brothers and sisters, the problem that I'm facing this morning and the problem that I'm facing in trying to do this teaching is that this truth is so powerful and it's so profound that I can't even do it justice with a teaching. It's virtually impossible for me to be able to teach this because it's something you've got to experience for yourself. 
So what I'm trying to do today is encourage you to try to experience that. Try to experience victory through song, through dance, through tambourines. Whatever, make a joyful noise, whatever your noise is, make it to Hashem and stand back and watch Him fight your battles and win your victories. As we continue to study the scriptures, we see that these things are true. I'm not making this up. And that music is used continually in scripture to express, what does it express? It doesn't just express happiness and joy. It also expresses redemption. And it, it's an expression of overcoming our enemies. And music and song is also used prophetically for Adonai's victories over HaSatan. And music is also symbolic of our future redemption. In Yeshiyahu 26, verse 19, Adonai says, Your dead will live. My corpses will rise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. For your dew is like the morning dew, and the earth will bring the dead to life. I believe the following prophecy is related to our parashah, where in Shemot, Exodus 15, 20, we read, All the women went out after her with tambourines, dancing as Miriam sang to them. This was symbolic and representative of what Adonai had done for them. And by that, I mean, he won their freedom. He won their salvation. He won their redemption. The prophecy, I believe, harkens back to this great salvation event in the history of Israel. It's found in Jeremiah 31, verse 4, where it says, Once again, I will build you. You will be rebuilt, virgin of Israel. Once again, listen to what he says. This is prophetic. This is future events. Once again, equipped with your tambourines. You will go out and dance with the merrymakers. Prophetically, we can see that songs and music are symbolic of overcoming the enemies of God. And in a passage that also points back to Parashat Beishalak, Revelations 15, verses 2 through 4, it says this, I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those defeating the beast, its image and the number of its name, were standing by the sea of glass, holding harps which God had given to them. Listen, they were singing the song of Moshe, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and wonderful are the things you have done, Adonai, God of heaven's armies. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Adonai, who will not fear and glorify your name? Because you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. I believe one of the lessons we learn from our parashah, in light of Revelation 15 verses 2 to 4, is that if we should sing praises to him for his mighty acts of overthrowing Egypt, and throwing the horses and the rider into the sea as the song goes, then how much more, brothers and sisters, should we praise him for saving us from the clutches of sin and death and Hasatan? You ever thought about that? You thought what he did in Egypt was something amazing. You thought the horse and rider being thrown into the sea was amazing. Do you know what he's done for you? He saved you from the clutches of sin and death. He saved you from the adversary that is Ha-Satan. And you don't want to sing praises. You want to sit back while everybody else stands up and sing. What is wrong with you? What's wrong with you? The victory that he has accomplished in your life is so much greater than throwing a horse and a rider into the sea. As for those who might feel a little bit foolish, and I think that's probably most of the problem when we come to sing on Shabbat or we meet in person and we're face to face and we're, we're kind of shy to stand up and sing or whatever the case may be. For those who might feel that way, you feel a bit foolish when your brothers and sisters see you lift up your voices in praise and worship. Well, for those who feel, may feel foolish when the world sees you doing that, can I just encourage you today, don't think of it as being a fool to the world. 
Think of it more along the lines as being seen as a fool for Messiah. Change your view, change your perception of what you actually see. I'm not a fool to the world because I don't care about what the world thinks. And if they want to think me a fool, then that's just fine. I'll be a fool for my Messiah. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 10, it tells us, for the Messiah's sake, we're fools. <laughs> Rav Shaul tells us that. For the Messiah's sake, we are fools. Again, brothers and sisters, we don't have to have a perfect voice. We just have to be willing to lift it up in praise to Adonai with a perfect intent because that's what he cares about. What is your intent behind the voice that you're lifting up? Because I want to tell you, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of Christian singers out there and I'll, I'll chase a small rabbit. There's a lot of Christian musicians out there who, brothers and sisters, have fantastic voices, but the intent behind the music that they're doing is completely wicked. If you know anything about the Christian music industry today, you'll know it's just that. It's an industry. It's a business. And it's in the business of making money. Stop idolizing these people. Stop idolizing the people who sound the best or look the most modern or most fancy. Stop idolizing those people. What I've learned throughout my life, and I've learned this in a lot of churches that we've been to, where we had a bunch of little old ladies. There's a bunch of little old ladies who would sit down on the front, and when it was time to sing, those little old ladies sang so loud you couldn't hear anybody else in the church. That's the way I was brought up. And I'll even give you an example. There was a congregation at Bex and I. We spent quite a few years joining in and being a part of online. When I first moved to the UK, there was a congregation. And they had, as part of their worship, as, as they started sort of building up to the Torah teaching, they had these, I think it was four little old women that would stand up in the front of everybody and they would sing praises to Hashem. And that's what these four little old ladies did. Now, they were not always in, on key. They were not always in tune or on pitch, but I want to tell you what, I was blessed more by that than I have been most things in my life because those women sang with intent. They sang from their heart. Every single bit of them was coming through their mouth. And this congregation, what did it do? It got rid of those women and it brought in a more fancy, a younger guy to come in and lead the praise and worship. And he came in with his guitar and he came in and he was the only one singing now. And now the focus had been turned to one person as opposed to these little old women who were standing up there singing with every bit of every part of their being to Hashem. Now we've got somebody that's more professional. I turned off at that stage. I switched off at that stage because it lost its intent. It lost its intent. My friends, listen. It's not necessarily the most impressive people that Adonai uses to accomplish his purposes. Or to sing his praises. Look, I like Paul Wilbur. I like Joshua Aaron. I like all these guys. But we need to be realistic here. Stop admiring men's talents. Stop admiring the man playing the guitar. Stop admiring him because he looks professional. It looks a certain way. Do you know what all that is in the realm of the kingdom? It's rubbish. It's for naught. It's for nothing. You're impressed by men. You're not impressed by the intent of their heart. You see, what I've come to learn, what I've come to realize is that more often than not, our creator in his wisdom, he uses the humble of heart. He uses those that the world would consider the least to accomplish his glorification and his great works. He doesn't use the most fancy. Moses was not the most fancy guy around. He could barely even speak a sentence. But God used him. Why did he use him? Because of his intent. The intent of his heart was pure. He knew that Moses would stand up there and represent me. And whatever comes out of his mouth, whether it's perfect or imperfect, it will be with a pure intent. Stop admiring organizations. Stop admiring people who can't even put one thing up without saying, oh, by the way, please donate. Stop admiring that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 25 to 28, Rav Shaul teaches a lesson about Josh. He teaches a lesson about me here. 
And I think if we would be honest with ourselves, maybe he teaches us a lesson about all of us. Listen to what Rav Shaul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 25 to 28. Rav Shaul teaches, For God's nonsense, brothers and sisters, God's nonsense that the world looks at and they say, all oh, that Torah observant stuff, and that Christianity looks at and they say, that Torah observant sense stuff is nonsense. It's nonsense. What does Rav Shaul say? He says, for God's nonsense is wiser than humanity's wisdom. And God's weakness, because people look at us and they say, well, you're, you're just weak doing all that Torah stuff. You're weak. Don't you realize you've been freed? What does Rav Shaul say? He says, guess what? God's weakness is stronger than humanity's strength. You don't even know what strength is. Listen to what he says to the brothers sat in the room with him here. And I can imagine, can you imagine sitting in this room and Rav Shaul saying this to you? Listen, let's, like, let's, let's sit here like he's talking to us, okay, and see how we would feel. He says, just look at yourselves, brothers. Look at those who God has called. Listen, not many of you are wise by the world's standards. Ouch. Not many wield power or boast noble birth. But God. And I can imagine Rav Shaul standing and, and, and maybe tears coming down his face as he looks around the room and he sees broken and humble men. And he says, but God chose what the world considers to be nonsense in order to shame the wise. Because brothers and sisters, that's what God does. He chooses all these things that people consider nonsense. He chooses all the people that, that the church and Christianity want to say are the outcasts those who were just trying to live humbly before the Lord. And he uses them to shame the wise. God chose what the world considered weak in order to shame the strong. And God chose what the world looks down on. You feel like the world looks down on you? Do you feel like you're less of a human? Do you feel like maybe because of maybe the job you do, you're not as important as somebody else? Do you feel like maybe because you don't have a three-piece suit, you're less of a person? Do you feel like maybe because you don't hold a certain position in your company, you're less of a person and everybody looks down on you? Brothers and sisters, be encouraged. Listen to what Rav Shaul says. He said, God chose what the world looks down on as common or regards as nothing in order to bring to nothing what the world considers important. Can we just digest that verse today? Can I ask you, can you stop at some point today and just digest the words of Rav Shaul's wisdom there? God chooses the things that the, people, that the world says are common and they regard as nothing. And why does he choose those special people? And I've seen this with little old ladies sitting on the front bench of a church. He chooses those people to bring to nothing what the world considers important. On this note, when the world and many of our Christian friends, they see us to come before God to praise and worship in song and in dance, whether it's in the midst of our assembly or throughout our week, because brothers and sisters, as I'm trying to teach you today, this should happen throughout your week. Many of those people, no doubt, will see you as dumb. They will see you as nothing but a fool. And I've even heard people refer to things that I'm doing and saying, you're nothing but a knuckle-dragging imbecile. That's all you are. You're back in the caveman days. You're trying to take everybody backwards with all this Torah stuff. Look, there's a mashal that's taught among the sages. And it goes along these lines. I want to share it with you today. In Bereshit Rabbah, chapter 5. A rabbinic commentary on the book of Genesis, Bereshit 1.9, is discussed. Listen to what this passage says. This comes from rabbinic literature here. It says, God said, let the water under the sky be gathered. To, th to this, Rabbi uh, Abba Bar Kahan said, in the name of Rabbi Levi, let the waters hope in me and wait for me. Listen, listen to that again. Let the waters hope in me and wait for me, said the Holy One. Blessed be he 
Let them wait in hope for what I'm about to do with them. For the Spirit of God had brooded over the silent waters, and the voiceless deeps had sung His praise and done His will in all. All voiceless nature had adored Him. The waters had not transgressed the limit placed for them, and the mighty deep, vast and wide, had humbled itself before Him. This may be likened in a mashal, a parable to a king who built a palace and he put dumb people to dwell in his palace. And those dumb people used to rise early in the morning to greet the king and to ask by means of signs and dumb show after his well-being, uncovering their heads and bowing down to do honor. The king said to himself, if this palace were only inhabited by rational beings, endowed with speech and full intelligence, how much more would they honor me with their works and with their praise? And so this king made to dwell in his palace intelligent and speaking people. But instead of praising him and worshiping him and serving him, they rose up and they seized upon the palace of the king. And they said, this palace belongs to no one but us. In that very hour, the king said, let this palace be as it was at first, a home for only the dumb to dwell in. Thus, from the beginning of his creation of the world, the only praise that went up to God was from the waters. Then said the Holy One, blessed be he, if these that have no mouth and no tongue, no speech and no words to set in logical order, can thus praise and honor me, how much more will be my praise when I've created mankind? And when he had created the sons of man, there arose the generations of Enosh and of the time of the flood and rebelled against him. In that hour, the Holy One, blessed be He, said, Let the world return to what it was at first, as it is written, and let the heavy rain be upon the earth. Brothers and sisters, instead of the generations of Enosh, may we fulfill Adonai's heart desire and sing praises to His name and to humble ourselves as simple servants. Each time we choose to invest time singing to Adonai, we're doing something powerful and you're doing something that is worthwhile, brothers and sisters. And each time you come here on Shabbat and you learn a new song in our congregation, do you know what Adonai is doing for us? He's continuing to equip our community to be victors and to win the daily battles that we face every day of the week. So I want to encourage you today, if you feel one of the songs coming back to you that we sang on Shabbat, if that comes back to you throughout the week, don't hold back. Don't worry about looking foolish. Sing it. Let's be fools for the Messiah. Let these songs stay with you throughout the whole week. And then next week, come back for more because I know John's going to have more for us. Come back and get some more. Each time we sing a song of praise and worship to Adonai, brothers and sisters, we're strengthened. We're strengthened. And His Word is further internalized in our being in ways that you cannot fully comprehend. As science is just beginning to discover, through the tool of music, Adonai is able to heal and work in us in ways we would never even imagine possible. Brothers and sisters, if you're not accustomed to singing and you don't know where to start, you say, Josh, that's never been a part of my life. What do I do? How do, how do I even get started? There's a short Hebrew prayer that comes from Tehillim 51, verse 15, that I want you to pray. And it's simple. And this is all that it says. Adonai, open my lips, then my mouth will praise you. Adonai, as we come before you on this Shabbat, may you, the holy, precious one, be our strength and our song today. Baruch Hashem, Adonai.